This time, we're going to be talking about personal defense in remote areas. Now, what I'm talking about when I say remote areas, it's not just the idea that you're somewhere that isn't densely populated, but also the idea that you're engaged in some kind of an activity that might affect what kind of gear that you can have or what your focus is on and whether or not you're with other people. So it might be remote definitely in the sense of being out away from a populated area. It might be remote in the sense of being isolated. And it might also be a factor that you can't have the things you would normally have with you to defend yourself in your everyday life. And maybe that's because of someplace outside the boundaries of the United States, or maybe in a state where you have, uh, you do not have a valid concealed carry permit or the right to keep and bear arms. And I've got some other things I want to talk about just kind of holistically on the idea of remote personal defense. Uh, what I want you to do is think about the things that you're hearing me say. Think about the questions that other people are asking. See if that inspires you to ask a question because these Q&As are always better if I'm actually answering your questions specifically. You're going to get more out of it. And chances are, if you thought to ask it, there are other people that you're going to help. As always at Personal Defense Network, we try to talk about as much as possible things that you can do practically. Not only things you can do practically in the middle of a worst case scenario, but also also equip you to be better prepared for that worst case scenario. And what that means is we might talk about some things today that are going to inspire you to want to go out and get certain pieces of equipment, a new piece of gear, perhaps. Maybe it's going to inspire you to train in a different way or to think what personal defense is all about. It's about being prepared with a strategy, with a response, and possibly to use the tools that you're going to need when you or someone that you care about is in danger. So hunting season is coming up, and honestly, I'm going hunting in about four days. I'm going to be going into South Dakota and doing some archery hunting. Obviously, when I'm out doing archery hunting, I can't carry a firearm. Because if I carry a firearm, I can be seen as someone who's trying to poach or violate the laws of the archery season in South Dakota. So that's really what inspired me to think about this topic. And, and it really is much broader than just hunting. Now, if you're a hunter, you may have thought about these things in the past. Maybe you haven't. We're going to address that today. A few months ago, a couple months ago, I was out camping. I took my older daughter, my younger daughter, and my granddaughter out in the wilderness in southwestern Colorado. Um, we were in a county where the average elevation is over 10,000 feet. We were at about 11,500 feet. And that creates its own safety concerns in terms of health and hydration and the amount of oxygen in the air and things like that. But the remote location also means we have to think a little bit differently about safety uh, and personal defense in that environment. But it was an environment where I was allowed to have firearms, carry a firearm or have other firearms in the camp. But in that case, I had kids around. And we had other people that might wander into the camp, for example. If we went off on a hike, leave the camp unattended, we have to think about the firearms that might be in that camp and how we're securing them and preventing unauthorized access, even in a remote area. There's a lot of other activities you might engage in that would be remote area activities. Uh, mountain biking might be one of them, hiking, um, any kind of uh, wilderness running, you know, uh, trail running. If you think about uh, climbing, ice climbing, really, really special gear, really special equipment. Obviously, you're trying to save weight. Rock climbing, you're probably going to go into a park or other controlled area that might not allow you to carry a firearm. And even if you were allowed to carry a firearm, would you really want the extra weight and potentially the extra bulk of a firearm while you're trying to scale a, a sheer rock face? Right. So a lot of things that, that come up when we start talking about remote area defense we think about maybe the firearm isn't going to play the same role in our preparation or our plan that it would in our everyday lives in an urban environment or with our everyday clothing being able to carry somewhat conveniently. Another thing we're going to talk about, of course, is in the wilderness environment, attack from an animal as opposed to that two-legged predator, the, the human being. And not thinking about someone who's trying to hurt us, trying to hurt somebody we care about, but think about that wild animal, wild animal that we might um, anger or we might cause to be in fear of us, that might attack us because we've gone into its territory, we've gone near its food source, we've gone near its nest, we've gone maybe near its children, near its offspring. And we have to think about that because obviously stopping a human predator can be very, very different from stopping an animal predator. So these are all the topics that are fair game for your questions. Um, I'm going to jump right into the questions. Uh, this, of course, is a free PDN Live event. Remember that there are other opportunities you have to interact with Personal Defense Network. You can become a premium member, you can become a gold level member, or you can become a platinum member. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those as we go through uh, this, this time that we have together here. Tim asks, uh, how do you defend yourself in a park that bans guns? And I obviously I already addressed that a little bit, the idea that personal defense isn't just about the firearm. 
one of the things that I've said over the years is the idea that being armed is a mindset, right? It's not a physical condition. It's not a, a physical state of being. It's a mental state of being. If you think about how you can defend yourself, and that's whether you're using a knife, whether you're using a gun, whether you're using your, your bare hands, whether you use your movement and the way you position yourself or any other improvised tool in your environment. We think about active shooter response in something like a school setting, right? What kind of things would be in a typical classroom or in a school environment that aren't firearms that you can use to defend yourself. Right away, you're going to come up with chairs, uh, sports equipment, scissors, uh, fire extinguishers, things like that. So let's think about that remote environment. What kinds of things might you take into uh, a park that bans the carry of firearms? What kind of things might you have with you? Well, right away, you know, walking stick comes to mind. Uh, utility knife comes to mind. Uh, some of the other things that you might have, pepper spray or specifically marketed bear spray might be an option for you or any other kind of chemical device. Electrical device like a stun gun or even better a taser type product that works on electro uh, muscular disruption, the EMD process. So not just the stun pain effect but actually disrupting the brain's ability to send messages to your muscles. So there's a lot of options you have outside of the firearm and it's definitely something you have to factor in. But again, let's go back into the context of you're doing mountain biking, you're probably not carrying a big walking stick, right? If you're on a mountain bike, you're also trying to cut as much weight as possible. Maybe you're in a place where you could carry a gun, but because of the activity you're involved in, whether it's kayaking, mountain climbing, mountain biking, you're not comfortable carrying a firearm because of the, the space, the weight, the bulk. You don't want to think about falling off of that bike and getting hurt. For example, I've done a fair amount of uh, dirt biking and some desert racing. And when you think about falling off that dirt bike, which I've done quite a few times in practice and in racing environments, uh, you think about having a piece of metal up against your hip, um, up against your midsection, even in, a, in kind of a chest rig or any kind of a chest harness, shoulder harness. If you were to fall off and have that, that piece of metal or hard plastic of the polymer gun impact you as opposed to maybe the soft ground, well, that could obviously injure you even more than just falling off wood. So it's not the idea that the gun's going to go off, but maybe the idea that where I carry my firearm when I'm engaged in an activity like that, same thing with rock climbing. You fall off the rock, even if you're, you're on a rope, you're going to come down and you're going to swing back against that rock face. Having a sharp, heavy object on you that could poke you or break a bone or hurt your hip or hurt your abdomen, hurt any kind of internal organs, that could be a problem. So you want to think about how you're carrying. Well, something like a crossbreed holster, uh, any of the hybrid holsters that has the large pad, whether it's the leather pad with crossbreed or any of the synthetic pads with some of the other brands that disperse the weight and disperse the imprint and then the, therefore the impact of that gun against your body might be a really good idea. One of the other things you might think about is a, a chest rig if you're on that dirt bike situation that is outside of the hard armor. It's always a good idea if you're doing a lot of aggressive off-roading on, on a dirt bike, maybe even with your mountain bike where you're wearing hard armor to protect your chest, you're wearing maybe a back plate, things like that. You have heavy pads on your hips and around your uh, leg your, your, and maybe shin pads, things like that. Anywhere where you have hard armor or heavy padding, thinking about carrying that firearm outside of that pad, worry about actually hurting yourself in that environment, right? Same thing holds true with your pepper spray. Same thing holds true with your taser. So when you're, when you're going into a park or going into an environment where you can't carry or you won't carry, some of the same exact things apply in terms of thinking about how you use your tools, how you train with those tools, and once you're in that park and once you're in that environment, think about how you're going to carry those tools. One thing that comes up, regardless of what the tool is, is accessing the tool with your equipment that you're using during these wilderness activities. So in other words, if you're, if you're wearing a harness, if you're wearing padding, if you're in a remote area in a cold weather situation and you're wearing extra heavy gloves, maybe you're um, snowmobiling, maybe you're cross-country skiing, something like that. So you've got extra padding on, you've got extra clothing on, and you're going to have to think about how to get to that firearm in the event that you actually do need to defend yourself. Now, in our gold level membership a live event today, we're going to be talking about the change in weather. We're talking about going into the cold weather environment, and that's something we're going to talk about is how do we think about carrying maybe in a pocket inside of a bulky jacket? Do we think about carrying on a chest rig outside of where we would normally carry? Do we think about how, we, how we're going to strip the gloves? And those could also be the utility gloves that we're wearing when we're doing something like the, the mountain biking, when we're wearing uh, gloves maybe to protect us in a kayaking situation from cold water, things like that. on the gun sometimes in personal defense world, and it's something we try to, to keep you uh, thinking in, in PDN beyond just the tool. Any tool that you rely on for your personal defense could break, um, you could 
uh, lose it in a scuffle. You could not have access to it because of an extreme close quarters attack, right? Um, a bear attack, for example. You know, you could find yourself in a situation where you get caught off guard. You're super hyper focused on something in that wilderness environment. Maybe it's one of your family members. Maybe it's cooking. You're in your camp. You're doing something. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom! Here's that animal: the mountain lion, the bear, whatever it is. You might have the firearm on your hip, but as you're trying not to get your face and your neck mauled, and you're trying to control the animal and trying to get your your defensive posture back before you can even access that tool, whether it's the knife, the taser, the pepper spray, the bear spray, or the gun, you're going to need those same type of skills that we talk about in an extreme close quarters situation with that human predator. So don't get too focused on the gun. You know, the, the, the reality is that a lot of people don't go certain places because they can't carry their guns. And I always ask them, you know, what are you giving a law in order to do something with a gun when you might have other options available to you. And certainly in the remote, in the wilderness environment, that's one of them. So let's go back to my hunting trip this week. So I'm going to be in a situation where I'm in a remote area and I'm going to have a weapon, right? I'm going to have a bow, but I'm not going to be able to have a firearm with me. Not likely, but it could be possible, certainly, that someone is going to try to attack me. So the area that we hunt has some public roads that go through that space, and you never know, right? Just like a violent predator could show up uh, you know, at the local convenience store, a violent predator could show up in the middle of nowhere beside this river in South Dakota. So what am I going to have? Well, I'm going to have the bow probably not a very practically valuable in a close quarters defensive situation. Um, I'm certainly going to have my unarmed skills, right? I have the option of carrying pepper spray. I normally don't do that, but if you, you are a believer in pepper spray, you certainly could have that option. Um, and again, the taser device. But one of the most important things, of course, is my awareness. You know, a lot of times people forget that, yeah, being out on your own and being alone in a wilderness environment makes you more vulnerable in some ways, but it also gives you the opportunity to, quote unquote, see that threat coming, right? So I'll be in a position where I'm literally sitting in this tree stand or I'm maybe moving it around and moving in a ground blind, but my whole job when I'm hunting, right, is to be paying attention to what's going on around me. So that, that same disadvantage that we have from being isolated also gives us the advantage of possibly seeing a threat coming before we actually need to be engaged with it. And that can be really, really helpful, right? If you see someone, you have the option, just like you do in a home defense situation, of using communication as a deterrent, right? So I might be able to use communication as a deterrent to let somebody know that, hey, I see them coming, that they're, they're not sneaking up on me, they're not gonna get close without me knowing that they're there. You know, if you're in a tree stand, you have uh, some isolation advantage also from the fact that the person would have to come up into the tree to hurt you physically. Now, if the person has a gun, are you at a disadvantage? Absolutely. Is there anything that I can give, you know, 15, 20, 30 feet away from somebody with a firearm and they're pointing it at you? There really isn't much to be done, to be done at that point. But if you're 50 yards or 100 yards away from someone and you see someone who's not supposed to be in the woods moving towards you, that could be your signal to get down out of that tree and get some of that maneuverability back. If it's an animal you're worried about, maybe it's a, a, a dog. You've got a, kind of a, a wild dog or a situation. Maybe it's a dog with rabies out there in the wilderness environment. Being up in that tree could be the best place to be. And of course, in that situation, the bow might be a good option to put that animal down and take that animal out of the equation. Um, would you be able to use a bow to defend yourself or a crossbow to defend yourself from a human predator? You know, it's possible. I mean, we all, we've all seen it happen in the movies and on TV. Uh, situations where it's happened in, in regular life, in the real world, but we have to be open to that possibility. Now, I'm not training defensively with that bow, but I have to be ready to think about that. And the same thing, if you're out bird hunting and you're carrying nothing but bird shot in a 20 gauge or a 410 shotgun, is that an optimal personal defense round? Absolutely not, but it's something to think about. Let me uh, move on here to the next question. What about keeping a gun inside of a sleeping bag? Okay, so when I, when I read this question, I immediately thought this is going to be one that, you know, if this were in the comment section or if this were a post in social media, this would probably get a lot of attention. So I want you to think about this and really just think about what your gut answer is. What about keeping a gun inside of a sleeping bag? Person goes on to say, when sleeping in a tent or a remote area. What are my thoughts on safety, uh, having the chamber loaded, the caliber, um, specifically referencing uh, concern about bears, uh, and, and what about if you're, uh, you have fellow campers in the same tent or in a nearby tent? And then thoughts on a handgun or a rifle when you need to go out at night if you're going to uh, hit the restroom or the, uh, maybe you're, you're in an unimproved cabin in a national park or national forest land where you can have firearms and they've got uh, one of those uh, pit toilets or something like that or you're just going to go to the tree line. Well, 
These are all really good questions. So let, let me kind of take it top to bottom. First of all, having a firearm inside of a sleeping bag. You know, my gut feeling on that right away would be, you know, that's really something you don't want to do because think about it. You don't know what's, you know, you're, you're moving around. environment probably seems like a bad idea. On the other hand, when you're in this, this environment, the tent, it's not like it's your home where you know that you can move around your bedroom. When you wake up in that tent, right, and, and personally, I've, I've used a rooftop tent. If you followed uh, Personal Defense Network for a while, you've probably seen uh, one of the tour trucks or another with that rooftop tent up on top. You've seen some of the things that I've posted uh, in my social media about my rooftop tenting experience. I love it, right? And it's not a big tent, but somewhere in there, there's probably a firearm, right? And it may not be right there with me. So what if you're in a situation where you can take something like a nano vault, um, one of the very small gun vaults, a quick access safe, and essentially put it inside that situation with you, whether it's in the tent or even inside your sleeping bag. You know, I don't want this safe rattling around in my sleeping bag, but it might be the best option, especially if you're in a situation where I was like the last couple months where I was camping with two toddlers in that rooftop tent. Well, obviously, if it, the gun's inside of a safe, it doesn't matter if it's inside the sleeping bag or outside the sleeping bag, but I'd rather have it inside that sleeping bag in that moment, right? So you think about how you're going to do that. Maybe you're going to have a pouch that you, you sew into the sleeping bag. Some sleeping bags do have um, utility or accessory pouches built into them already. That might be a good place to put that. What you would never want to do is just have that firearm loose inside the sleeping bag. And I, I doubt that that's um, what Martin was asking about, right? But if that, if that was your gut feeling right away was, well, no, I wouldn't want to have a firearm inside of a sleeping bag. I'm saying maybe you didn't consider the idea of having it inside of the quick access safe. And again, that's a really good idea inside of the tent too. Uh, moving on, he asks about caliber. Now, as far as the safety loaded chamber, it, you, the way you stage your gun in the wilderness, the way you carry your gun in the wilderness, shouldn't be any different than the way you stage your gun or carry your gun in your everyday life, right? So if you normally carry a 1911 with the safety on in a loaded chamber, well, then that's probably what you should be doing. If you carry a striker-fired gun that doesn't even have a safety, but you have a round in the chamber, that's what you should be doing. If there's any reason to doubt that that's the right thing to do, it probably comes from or you're not using the that you might wear in the public environment. So I know a lot of people in the wilderness or in remote areas will go to open carry. That maybe requires a different kind of holster, right? So if you normally have a holster with nothing but friction as a retention, you might want to go to some kind of a strap or other release or a hood or a lever or a button that gives you more retention than just grab the gun and pull. Because obviously, just because you're in the wilderness doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be alone and you don't want somebody else to be able to come up and grab your gun. Obviously, in the wilderness, a lot of us are also involved in some, some very high-level physical activity, right? Whether you're climbing, running, jumping, riding on some kind of a machine or horseback riding, having a gun even more secure than just a good friction fit holster, probably a good idea, especially if it's in the open. So um, that kind of answers the safety and loaded chamber issue. The caliber issue, a lot gets made of this. Now, let me go back to something I said earlier in the beginning. I talked about how there's a difference when you have to stop an animal versus stopping a human predator. What am I talking about? I'm not just talking about size or thickness of skin or any of that. Behaviorally, human beings, when they are met with resistance, overwhelmingly, right? This is one of the complex, the complex issues we have to bring up when we talk about the politics of guns. Overwhelmingly, when someone goes to hurt another human being and they believe that human being is set up to be a victim, and that human being reveals themselves as one that is armed and trained to use that armed tool to defend themselves, they run away, right? So bad guys say stop, they overwhelmingly run away. You drive out and shoot at them. What and that is a behavioral stop. Wild animals don't respond that way, especially one that's defending its nest, that's defending its young, or one that's, you know, like I said, the, the rabid dog scenario. They don't respond behaviorally to you brandishing a firearm. They may not respond behaviorally to the noise of the firearm, especially if they're already attacking you. So we have to really keep that in mind. When it comes to physically stop, when it comes to the need to stop an animal, we're almost always going to be talking about physical stops as opposed to psychological stops. Now, that's not to say that I'm not counting on the 9mm handgun I'm carrying to stop the human being. 
And this is where we get to size, weight, uh, the toughness of human skin versus animal hide, the thickness of animal hair we wear. And this is why most people, including me, would recommend if you're going to be carrying a firearm exclusively or more predominantly for the defense against a wild animal, uh, the bear particularly is what Martin's asking about, should you use a caliber greater than 9mm? Absolutely. What would I feel comfortable with? I'd feel comfortable with 357 Magnum. I'd feel comfortable with 44 Magnum. I'd feel comfortable with 44 Special. It's a heavier bullet that has a larger diameter. It's going to penetrate deeper. I'd be comfortable with 10 millimeter auto. Those would probably be the calibers that I would personally stick with when it comes to defense. And we're balancing a higher level of power, a greater degree of penetration against the recoil and then obviously the size of the round because that dictates capacity as well. So with a, a full-size revolver, I can have six rounds of the 44 caliber. I can maybe have eight rounds of 357 Magnum. With a 10 millimeter auto, which is quite a package when you think about carrying one firearm and having 17 rounds of 10 millimeter auto, that's pretty good defense against whatever bear is going to show up. But you also need to train and practice with that firearm. Keep that in mind. The other part of the question here that Martin asks is, well, what about the other people in the tent or the other people around the tent? The people in the tent, we kind of cover that with the holster, with keeping the gun inside the bag and certainly inside of a quick access safe. But let me ask you this, what about the other people around you. Think about it. You get woken up in the middle of the night with a bear or a mountain lion attack through the, the, a traditional ground tent, or maybe you're sleeping in a, a, I don't know, maybe like a hammock tent. You've got a whole bunch of campers around you. That bear is attacking you. You pull your gun out. Well, we all know we're responsible for every round that comes out of that gun. That is definitely something to think about and something that you really just have to be able to, to try to think about ahead of time and then work into your response even in the middle of that animal attack in the middle of the night, right? Knowing in which direction there are going to be other people, knowing in which direction there are other tents. And again, when you go out at night to use that uh, latrine or you know, find a, a tree to lean up against, you're going to need to think about which direction people are in. But there's really no difference in that scenario than you being in a restaurant, you being at the mall, or you being inside of your own home. Maybe the biggest difference from your home to the wilderness environment is it is more like the public space in that it's not something you've rehearsed and it's not something you've been able to plan out over and over and over again for a number of years, right? You know when you're in your master bedroom which walls or which other people are probably sleeping. When you get to your camp, you can think about setting your the perimeter or if you think of the running water as a natural barrier to the animals, well, then put everybody else on that side, and you're going to be at the front edge. Maybe there's a road that comes in. If you're worried about the human predators in the remote area, you put yourself at the front of the camp in an area where if someone were walking into the camp or coming towards the camp to hurt someone, you would be in that position at the, 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 to guard, if you will, the rest of the camp. That You would be the first potential threat. And that's something that we do, right? As providers, as caretakers, we put ourselves in a position to receive that threat rather than have our kids or other people that we care about receive that threat. That also then will set you up to know that, you know, based on which way you're oriented, that direction is where the good guys are, that direction is more wilderness, right? And that's definitely something to keep in mind when we think about that. Um, Martin ends with, when is a knife uh, or any contact weapon, I assume is what he means by or such, a better option? You know, I don't really think it's ever a better option in terms of preparation. But in the moment, could it be a better option for sure? And the answer, again, wouldn't be any different um, than it would be with the, with the handgun. Uh, sorry, in the public environment or in your home with the handgun. So when I think about pulling that handgun out, I need space to be able to use it, right? I don't want it to be used against me. And obviously, in the situation in that tent, in that close quarters, I need to make sure that when I pull that gun out, I'm not likely to be discharging it in the direction of any other bystanders or family members. So in some cases, if, if an animal were already on top of me, for example, and I had the choice of going to my belt line and pulling out the gun or pulling out the knife, there might be some situations where a knife would be a better option. But you also need to start thinking about anatomy. You need to start thinking about, obviously, any training that you've already had with the knife. Um, how that applies to an animal versus applies to a human being. Basically, same concept, right? You're gonna, you know that there's going to be arteries at the joints. You know that the neck and the face are going to be available to you. However, with the knife, you may have a much harder time reaching any kind of vital organs on a, an animal, especially a larger animal like a bear, than you would on a human being. But if you think about um, going in towards joints or going in towards the neck or the face, that's probably going to be your, your biggest uh, return on investment with a knife there. 
Uh, next question. Can you take down a bear or mountain lion in self-defense with lead ammo? Um, not sure that, that I understand the, the question completely, but if, if the idea is uh, lead, just unjacketed, regular lead ammunition, a lead round nose bullet, um, there have been a lot of people who have talked about cast bullets as being a good idea for defensive use for, for a bunch of different reasons, a bunch of different theories on that. Um, usually that involves heavier calibers, larger calibers, something like the 44 Special, 44 Magnum, where you just have a, a traditional lead, flat nose, or round nose bullet. Uh, personally, I would want the best ammunition that I could put in that gun and work reliably. So I'm going to want the bonded hollow points. I'm going to want expanding hollow points. I'm going to want those types of rounds. Uh, the bonded jackets obviously help penetration uh, because they have uniform expansion and weight retention, and that means we're going to get a deeper penetration with the wider hole that gets cut by the, uh, the expanding ammo with a bonded jacket. So that, that would still be my choice. I wouldn't want to go to a, a solid bullet for any reason. I wouldn't want to go to a uh, fully jacketed bullet, whether it was uh, round nose or flat nose, truncated, whatever it might be. The exception might be if I only had nine millimeter, for example, if I couldn't step my caliber up, would I want to increase the depth of penetration? Well, if I were in Alaska and I was out salmon fishing or something like that, and I was carrying a handgun for defense and thinking about bears, more solid projectile that was going to penetrate deeper just because of the nature of the hide and the depth to the vital organs on a bear, uh, that might be a consideration. But generally speaking, uh, Jorge asks, what is, uh, what is your go-to most reliable sidearm? Um, well, that's not really related to remote defense, I guess. When I'm in a remote environment, um, in the past, have I carried a revolver in places w instead of a semi-automatic? I absolutely have. Today, uh, I don't know that I would do that. But my, my understanding and knowledge and comfort with uh, holsters, with the reliability of handguns, um, the way they are today, semi-automatic handguns, I have several guns that I would absolutely trust to work in a remote environment. Now, if I were going to be particularly dusty, dirty, uh, like let's go back to desert racing. If I were going to be in an environment where I knew it was nothing but dust and silt, and it was going to be an extended, you know, uh, maybe just a backpack trip on a dirt bike in a very silty, dusty environment for several days in a row, might I just choose to carry that eight-shot revolver instead of a semi-automatic? Yes, in that environment, that revolver is going to be more reliable and less susceptible to the dust and dirt and grit. Absolutely, 100%. So in that environment, I might think about that. Otherwise, I'm going to stick with a semi-automatic pistol. Again, we were talking about like the bear country concept. Uh, I, I would probably lean toward 17 rounds of 10 millimeter over eight rounds of 357 or, or six rounds of 44 Magnum. Um, it was just a big story about someone stopping a bear internet. So was that kind of sensationalized? Absolutely. Is it possible that one of the reasons that that story went viral was because it's, it's an anomaly. Most people think, oh, you're going to need to have that 44 Magnum or 357 Magnum or 10 millimeter auto, something at much more powerful caliber than we normally think about. Absolutely. But uh, there's some, some really impressive. I wouldn't, all I had was a 9 millimeter, but I'd probably step the, the caliber game up to 10 millimeter, but not um, switch to a revolver personally. Um, let's see. Well, let me talk about uh, a couple of things. I'm going to take a little break here uh, because it is today the 21st of October. And in a little less than two weeks, I'm going to be gathering with um, some people that you've seen here on uh, Personal Defense Network and some other people from around the firearms community. And we're going to be talking about gun rights. Now, you know that at Personal Defense Network, I generally keep the politics out of what we're talking about with personal defense. But in this case, I do want to give a people like this. It's when we get most of our views on these live events. And I want you to join us. We're going to be on the West Lawn of the U.S. Capitol Building on November 2nd from 1 to 4 p.m. And we've got over two dozen speakers. I'll be one of them. Um, Todd Fossey, who's been doing uh, some work with us here at uh, Personal Defense Network. I was just talking to him. He's based here in Minnesota. He's going to be joining us out there. Um, Derek Poole will be out there. Barrett Kendrick will be out there. You know them as the co-hosts of our training talk show. There's going to be a lot of people from around the PDN community and around the gun community talking about a very wide perspective of why our gun rights are important. And you know how I feel about our gun rights being incredibly important to our right to protect ourselves and those we care about. Ultimately, I think that's pretty clearly what the Second Amendment is all about. It's about our right to defend ourselves. It's about our right to defend our families. And ultimately, if we need to, the right to defend our way of life.
uh, west lawn of the U.S. Capitol building. You can learn more about it at secondamendmentrally.com. And as one of the organizers of the event, I will tell you it really helps us if you plan on attending and you're bringing some other people. Go to secondamendmentrally.com, sign up for the email list, register. That email list, by the way, um, there's no sponsors here. There's no company behind this. There's no organization behind this. It's just a, a group of concerned American gun owners who are putting this on. That email list is going to be destroyed after the event. Um, but we do want to be able to be in touch with you guys about last minute announcements some travel tips for DC, obviously some of the gun laws in DC we want you to be aware of, things like that, as well as some special deals on some hotels and metro line information in case you want to stay in Tom, go ahead and check that out. PSA here on the Q&A Live for October at PDN. We're going to talk about um, is using a 410 3-inch PDX-1 defense load shell, which is four discs, um, a very detailed question. Four discs followed by Judge or the Bond Arms Derringer, a reasonably effective bad guy solution in a nighttime home defense scenario. There's a lot going on there in that question, Kenneth. So first of all, let's, let's kind of go back and look at what we're talking about. Now, we have done some testing. I think you can find some video here at Personal Defense Network on this round. It's the PDX-1 or Defender round from Winchester, specifically designed to work in the handguns, which are rifled barrels, so a rifled bore, the handguns that are short barreled, but are chambered for 410. So you can put this 410 shot shell in there, and you do get the BBs, but you also get these little discs. The discs grab onto the rifling in the bore, and they tend to fly pretty true. Out to about 20, 25 yards, you're going to be able to keep those pellets, but, uh, sorry, not the pellets, but the discs relatively close to one another. Now, the pellets will spread out very, very rapidly. They're essentially spun out like a, like a donut because of the rifling, which means you have a little hollow space in the middle. Well, with these rounds, those discs, which were specifically designed for these types of firearms, will fill that, that middle ground right there. So in close, you're very likely, you know, out to about, I don't know, five, eight yards, you can keep all the pellets and all the discs inside of that human chest torso size pe pellet pattern. But as you go further out, those pellets are going to disperse, as are the discs. Ultimately, because they're all so light, and this is really important to the momentum of the round, because those pellets are the way that those things travel, and as they lose their momentum, they lose their ability to track, and you lose power very rapidly because of the disc shape and then because of the weight of the discs and the pellets. So these are really designed for close quarters situations. One of the things that I know a lot of people like about the, those guns and these rounds in particular is that in the environment we were talking about who else is exactly around you or where they are, these rounds lose power very, very, very quickly. But they deposit a lot of energy in an extreme close quarters environment very, very well. So when you think about something like a wild animal, and you're trying to cause as much damage because, again, we know we're not going to get any kind of behavioral effect. That wild animal that might be right on top of you, especially, and now you've got the reliability of a revolver, this is where some make a little bit more sense than they do in the general public space. Now, as far as inside of your home, and again, personally, I'm a big fan of, of bonded hollow point bullets using a handgun as your primary defensive home defense tool just like you would carry out in the public space and i'm not a fan of those particular guns in the public space so is it a horrible choice it's not a horrible choice is it an optimal choice no it's, it's definitely not what we recommend but you can learn more about those rounds um, and why those rounds absolutely if you're going to go with a tourist judge those rounds that are specifically designed for it that's absolutely the way to go and the bond arms gerund or anything else that shoots a 410 you want to take a look at, at those rounds. Um, ghost tactical. Have an exit strategy from any point is crucial. Knowing where you are and how to get out is always most important to think about. So this now, as we get into the, the towards the end of this uh, Q&A live, definitely into the second half here, what Ghost is talking about here is, is really important to process. Defense in a remote area. Now, we've talked a lot about the tactics and the guns and all this kind of stuff. Let's talk about what's really the biggest threat about being in a remote area. The biggest threat about being in a remote area is that you don't have help, right? You're cut off from general assistance, you're cut off from extra supplies, and you're cut off from medical attention especially. You might also be cut off from communications. So, you know, how many of us uh, kind of lament the fact that we don't have maps in our car, right? How many of you have ever been in a situation or a position where you were navigating somewhere and your phone died? Right? And whether you're on, on foot, you know, just trying to get somewhere in a city looking at a map, or you're following that blue line on your, your navigation and your phone dies, and now you're like, wait, I really don't have any practical idea where I am. Like, I kind of know the time zone, right? 
that's a problem. And if you're in a remote area, and especially if you're relying on electronics, you're relying on you know, the sun and the, whatever it is you're relying on, and you lose the ability to follow that. So now you're out after dark, right? And you, you, you were heading west, and, yet, and now it's dark, and you're off the trail, and you're not even sure on electronics, or you don't have cell signal. Hey, now you've got a problem. What are you going to do? You're going to hunker down. Well, you hunker down, and you, you spend the night in the wilderness. You wake up in the morning. There's the sun. You know where west is, and you find your way to the highway. But in the meantime, what are you going to do if you're caught off guard or you're caught out in the wilderness and you need assistance? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be relying on the gun as your only defensive tool. You know I'm a big fan of carrying medical equipment and having medical training as well. So this is going to become even more important. If you take any kind of medications, you want to make sure that you have not only the supply for how long you think you're going to be out in this remote area, but have some extra. You might also want to think about whether it's your backpack or on the horse or in your truck if you're doing overland stuff, keeping your medicine in a couple of different places. So you've got your primary uh, medicine, your daily medicine, whatever it is you need to take. You've got your primary medical equipment. You've got your emergency medical equipment. And then you've got another storage of the same things. That way, if you get separated from your, your main storage or something gets wet, medical, medical kit, I've been, um, look up the SF responder and just put in ankle medical kit into the search bar here at Personal Fence Network. You're going to see what that medical kit looks like. Got, well, think about it. If I'm in the remote wilderness and I've got you know my daughter with me or I'm out with a few friends and I've only got one set of medical gear, which is what I'm carrying right now, I may be you know woefully underprepared if we all get caught in a landslide, if uh, there's an accident with a vehicle, if there's um, accident with the, the recreational vehicle, you know, if there's an animal attack, you know, and, and a couple of us get wounded, well, all of a sudden, um, instead of everybody having their own or us being right there with a 911 call and medical attention or medical help not being far away, now we're in a remote environment. So it makes sense for me to have my primary medical gear and some secondary medical gear, especially enough to cover everyone that's in your group if you're traveling with a group. So that's really important. The navigation issue is also important. You want to have a couple of different ways to navigate. Certainly, you can use landmarks. Um, again, just the simple fact that if you're, you're in the northern hemisphere, the sun is, you know, it's either going to be, you know, over to the east, over to the west, or somewhere south of you. Like, just, just knowing that can set you up for success if you know that the interstate highway runs parallel to, you know, your hiking path and you've got to go to the west to run into the main highway to at least have a chance to signal help or find help when you need to. Um, having some ways to navigate is important. Does that mean you have to be like, you know, the master of land navigation and compasses and, you know, how to read a topographical map? No, absolutely not. Would it help you? Yes, absolutely it would. But usually, just with terrain, with land, look at that map and no wilderness if you're taking other people with you, that can be the make or break thing. You know, if you know, hey, just find the river and the river goes basically east and west and when you get to the river, you want to go to the west because that's going to get you back to civilization or that's going to get you back to cell service. Those little things can really, really mean a lot. If you're going out um, in, a, in a vehicle that, that takes fuel and you can take extra fuel, you want to do that. You want to have a reserve as well. If you can't take extra fuel, let's say you're on that dirt bike, you know, don't plan your trip so that you're, you're you know, down to the last two miles, right? You don't plan a 60-mile trip with a two-mile reserve. You know, plan a 40-mile trip with a 20-mile reserve. That way, you know, you go out 20 miles, you go in the wrong direction, coming back 20 miles, you still got enough, enough reserve to try to find your way to some kind of a help. Same kind of thing is going to work with the Jeep, with the Toyota, whatever it is that you're running around with, with a truck. Now, a lot of people like to travel in groups, and that can be really helpful. But when you're traveling with a group, you want to kind of know who you're traveling with. And I think this plays into this idea, too. If you know that the person you're traveling with, that they have everything taken care of, make sure you talk to them about it. Find out what they have. If nothing else, you want to know where their reserve water is, where their medical equipment is, where their signaling equipment is. Maybe it's, maybe it's flares. Maybe it's mirrors. Maybe it's uh, just the, the chem lights for the middle of the night. You want to know where their emergency equipment is. That's going to be really important to understand. Um, but for sure, Thinking about what you're going to do if you get stuck somewhere, and then what if your normal plan or your actual plan of your route or your timing or your distance that you're going to travel fail, what's your next steps? You know, having that kind of a plan is important. And that's whether you're hunting, camping, dirt bike racing, whatever it may be. I want to talk to you again. I, I think we just had this come up on the screen, and uh, we're getting close to the end here. So one opportunity to get in on some tips for subcompact handguns. Now, what's the connection to subcompact handguns and remote wilderness areas? Remember what I said before, if I'm out, you know, on some kind of a, a trail run, if I'm out on a mountain bike, if I'm out rock climbing, if I'm out kayaking, 
I might want to carry a smaller gun than I normally do, right? Maybe I'm out fishing in a canoe or something, right? If I'm going out fishing and I've got, you know, the, the, I got the tackle box, I got the fishing pole, and I got the net, and I got the cooler, and I got the beverages, and I got all that stuff, like maybe I'm just trying to save as much weight as I possibly can. Maybe I don't want, again, with the rock climbing scenario, I'm not going to carry the gun that I normally carry. I'm going to carry something smaller, you know, that I, I, I used to carry a, a very small semi automatic in the back of a chalk bag when I would climb, right? So literally, Literally, I mean, I'm, you know, t-shirt, shorts, climbing shoes, harness, tiny little semi-auto in the pouch of the chalk bag, that's a subcompact handgun. Some compact, some compact handguns are incredibly popular for carry. I carry a single stack subcompact gun as my primary gun most of the time. And these five tips for using the subcompact pistols, um, go ahead, get that now, click on that, check that out, and uh, you're going to like them, I think. It's, it's right in line with the stuff we talk about, Personal Defense Network, right in line with the Combat Focus Shooting Program, right in line with intuitive defensive shooting skills. But just some tailored tips, if you haven't thought about these things, in some cases, it's just reminders of stuff you probably already know, or a little bit of a tweak on how our general fundamental ideas about defensive shooting apply to the small subcompact gun. So check that out. Um, thoughts on Scott Munitions tumble upon impact ammo. You know, I haven't tested any of, of that ammo. It's interesting uh, that you bring that up because when I talked about the cast bullets, the flat front lead bullets, that's one of the things that people talk about with those particular bullets is that when they hit, the damage that they cause is through tumbling. So this is a, an evolved, you know, kind of a, a packaging of that idea and an, an evolved way of looking at the tumbling idea that the bullet just not by expansion, not by breaking up, just because it's going to move through the body um, and change size as it moves through just because of the angle. Um, that's what we're talking about here. Personally, I haven't tested it. Um, I would put it in the category of, of a specialty ammunition, and I'm generally very leery of specialty ammunition until I've had a chance to test it myself and test it repeatedly. One of the problems with specialty ammunition is that you might, you know, fire it into gel through clothing one time, or you know, maybe you're going to do some leather. You're going to simulate animal hide. You're going to fire it into some gel. Or you're going to see somebody fire it into gel. Fourth one, you really have to get a, a wide array. Now here at Personal Defense Network, you've seen us do a lot of gel tests, and you probably haven't seen us do a lot of multiple rounds exactly the same way with the same bullet. But when it's a common bullet, when it's a bullet like uh, one that the FBI has tested, the, like the Ranger line from Winchester, which is essentially the Defender line, same engineering in the bullet, you can go out and cross-reference all of the gel tests that have been done, look at the demonstra demonstration that I've shown you, look at all the data that's been collected, and see a wide array of testing. Essentially, it's been done, even though I haven't shown you 100 gel shots. With specialty ammunition, that can be a little bit harder. So um, again, personally, um, I'm skeptical until I see it proven. And there are so many other proven rounds out there that I'm not super excited about jumping into a, uh, a new specialty round. Uh, let's see, we've got, oh, look, our friendly host has put in the uh, medical kit. That's good. And the subcompact pistol uh, coming up here. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and start wrapping this. It's been about defense in remote areas. And again, I've really let it be powered for the most part by your questions. Um, a couple of things I want to talk about in general. First of all, and this goes back to a little bit what we talked for getting out, is once you go into that remote area, you know, you, you don't have the knowledge to tell you to get away if you can, and then call the police. Recating asterisk of, and if the police don't get there in time, you need to be prepared to defend yourself if the bad guy gets through that door. Well, the police aren't going to show up when you're in the wilderness area. They, they, they aren't going to get there in time for the bear attack. They aren't going to get there in time for the, the, the human predator that's looking for isolated victims out in the national park or something like that. You really have to be self-sufficient. And obviously, the nature of the person who comes to Personal Events Network, I think the nature of our audience and of our members is that you want to be able to take care of yourself. You want to be able to take care of other people. It becomes even more important in that remote environment. I've seen far too many people and heard about far too many people who have gone out hunting with, you know, not so much as like, you know, an apple or like a protein bar in their pocket. You know, they get caught out overnight, they get lost, they get, they go off tracking a deer, all of a sudden they look up and they realize they are nowhere near their tree stand, they're nowhere near their trail, they don't have any idea where they are, and oh, there's a storm coming in, right? Um, the, the amount of time that gets spent on, on search and rescue for remote area like sheriff's departments or fire rescue units, um, it's immense. And a lot of the times that people get found, and we deal with this a lot down in southwestern Colorado, we find people who went out thinking, you know, I'm only going to be out for a couple hours. I'm going to stay on the trail. I've been out here before. I'm out here with a bunch of people. I don't need extra water. I don't need extra food. I don't need my prescription meds. I don't need a light source. I don't need 
uh, any kind of rain gear or any kind of blanket or jacket, you know, emergency space blanket that folds up and fits in your back pocket of your jeans could be the difference between life and death if the temperature drops, especially if you're in a mountain environment where it could be 60, 65 degrees during the day and 20 degrees at night, and then weather rolls in and you've really got a problem. So I want you to first and foremost pull the gun, not the crazy animal attack, not the, uh, you know, spree killer or the, the serial killer that's looking for somebody in the back end of the, the park. Just think about, I got trapped overnight. I slipped and broke my leg, and I'm having a hard time getting out and moving, and I may have to wait till somebody finds me on the side of the trail. My vehicle broke down. My ATV or my dirt bike or my off-road vehicle broke down. Directions were wrong. I looked at the map upside down, and I found myself way further away from that next cabin or the next shelter or the next highway or where they were going to pick me up if I was kayaking down the river. I, I'm not, I, I don't find my exit point, right? Where the key doesn't work. The combination doesn't work on the National Forest cabin I was renting, and I can't get into the cabin. What are you going to do then? All right, so some of the things I like to do. Obviously, we talked about medical equipment. Um, protein bar, really good idea. Have a couple extra protein bars in a backpack or, you know, in your cargo pocket or whatever. Um, space blanket, you know, or any kind of like, like fishing gear. Fishermen have this thing, figured you can roll them up, you stick them in a cargo pocket, throw them in a backpack. And when you start adding all this stuff up, I'm still talking about, you know, like a fanny pack. I'm thinking about a very small day pack that you can put on your back. Extra water. That's probably going to be the heaviest, bulkiest thing that you're going to have to carry around. So you know, you've got your medical equipment, you've got your space blanket or your lightweight rain gear that's going to give you another insulating layer too. It doesn't have to just be for rain. That's going to give you an extra insulation layer to trap air underneath of that, that waterproof uh, equipment. You've got um, some water. Um, that's probably, again, going to be the bulkiest thing. You know, If you think you're going to be out for one hour or two hours, a bottle of water is probably fine. If you think you're going to be out for six hours, now you want to start th thinking about a couple of different, like, you know, if you have like six of these, does that take up a lot of space? Yeah, but six of these, that's, that's plenty for the overnight thing, right? It's plenty if you get trapped out there for a day or two. You think about that guy that, you know, got trapped in the rock, right? He ended up having to saw his arm off. And we're not going all the way to saw your arm off, but let's just say you were trapped in the rock or a tree falls down. Again, you hurt your leg, you hurt your hip, you hurt your back. You're out there for 24 hours, 30 hours before somebody comes and finds you. Water really is, is a great sustainer of life just to keep you alert, keep you healthy, keep you um, as, as able to cope with anything else that's going on as possible. Um, and then, of course, signaling device. You know, a whistle is, a, is as old-fashioned as that sounds. A whistle can be the difference, right? If someone's walking around looking for you and you're down on the ground, a tree fell over, you're stuck on the ground, and they are just looking, they may not see you, but 100 yards away, 200 yards away, if the wind's in your direction, in your favor, that whistle could make the difference, right? Um, potentially, people talk about fire starters, things like that. I'm way more interested in you having an extra insulating layer than I am you worried about you know, building a survival fire, right? Um, but certainly some kind of heating pellets, things like that, um, the, the, any kind of wood fire starter, that can generate a little bit of heat. But I think the insulating layers and being protected from the environment when that fire goes out or if you can't start a fire, that's going to be way more valuable to you. So these are just some things to think about when you're going out in that remote area. Certainly personal defense network, we're going to talk about firearms, we're going to talk about tasers, unarmed defense, knife defense, all of that. But wilderness survival survival usually is about your wits and your gear, right? Having the good gear and really knowing what's going on and making a good plan so that you don't get trapped. And if you do get hurt or something goes wrong, you have some redundancy in your equipment and in your planning and in your communications so that you can last as long as possible. Because let's face it, in the modern world, when are we really all that remote? You know, if you let people know where you're going, people know where you're going to be hunting, you park your truck, your other friends, your family, somebody's going to call somebody and say, hey, they were supposed to be back 12 hours ago, or they were supposed to be back before sunset. They were supposed to be back, you know, by noon. If you're not there by dinner, somebody's calling. If you're not there by midnight, somebody's calling. Rescue or the sheriff's department comes looking for you, or maybe it's just your hunting party that comes out and finds you three hours later. Emergency medical equipment, keeping yourself warm, keeping yourself hydrated, and to some extent keeping yourself fed and any prescription meds you need, that could really be the difference between life and death in that remote survival situation. Thanks for watching the Personal Defense Network live Q&A. As always, you can throw in some more uh, questions, and we'll keep an eye on the, uh, the questions and comments for the people that aren't watching us live. Watch us over the next 24 to 48 hours. I will try to answer them. And go in the Personal Defense Network and search around to do follow-up on all of these topics. Don't forget about the Second Amendment rally, and don't forget about the five tips for subcompact firearms, not just for the wilderness, but for your everyday as well, if you're like me and that single stack subcompact is your primary.